Good evening. My name is Jason Wallace. I'm the pastor of Christ Presbyterian Church here in the Salt Lake Valley, and we welcome you to another installment of the Ancient Past. Last week we began talking about the importance of the visible church and how the church as a covenant community is not an option for the believer. But there's a flip side to much of what I said last week, one that we see pop up over and over in church history. When people see how important the church is, that it is the pillar and ground of the truth, when they see that it is the household of God, the church of the living God, they look out at the world and they say, how does, what, how does the church that I see fit with that? And I think that there's a misunderstanding that lies at the root of many of the misunderstandings that we have today. Uh, there is a temptation to look at the book of Acts where we have these wonderful descriptions of how the early Christians there had all things in common. They were of one mind, one, one soul. They were breaking bread from house to house. There was great unity and peace. There's a temptation for people to expect that as the norm and to think that something must be dreadfully wrong with the church if it's not in that ideal state. Now that misunderstanding leads to a whole host of others, as I just said. One example is that when people look at the church today, they see that the church uh, in America in particular has become worldly, has become compromised in many ways. It is fragmented. It is dominated by personalities. Uh, on the one hand, you see people who splinter the church over what version of the Bible uh, is used because they think that there is an inspired English translation. Uh, there are good English translations and bad English translations, but there's no inspired English translation of the Bible. That is something that um, people invent to, to, to justify their own existence. On the other hand, we see churches that say, you know, aren't we supposed to love one another? Aren't we supposed to be united in Christ? Jesus prayed in that high priestly prayer that all the, that the disciples would be one. So shouldn't we be manifesting that love and unity that Christ prayed for? And so they end up compromising. Many dispensationalists look at the church today and they see it in its corrupted, weakened state and they compare it to this idyllic vision that they think was the apostolic church that they see described there in places like Acts 2. And they say, well, obviously the church age is, is if not completely over, almost over. The, the thinking of dispensationalism is that there are these various dispensations and they all end in failure. And the church age is going to end in failure as well. And the evidence of that is when we see the weakness and the division within the church, when we see the compromises, when we see all these other things, there is a temptation for many people to think, well, this is just further evidence that the church age is coming to an end and we're all going to get raptured away. It's only when you have this unrealistic expectation of what the church is supposed to be here and now that you can dismiss the church. Similarly, Joseph Smith pointed to all the divisions within the church. He said there were Baptists, there were Methodists, there were Presbyterians, and they were all arguing amongst themselves about who the, the right church was. And obviously there must be something fundamentally wrong for there to be these kinds of divisions. And what he offered was not the end of the church age, but rather a restoration. He believed the church age had ended, and now there was going to be a restoration of the true church. This wasn't something new with him. In fact, it wasn't even new with most of his followers. This kind of appeal has been made throughout church history by men who look at the church and they say, look at all the divisions. And what they do is they say, let's not be like those people. Let's come out and just be simple Christians, biblical Christians. And what do they do? They create more division. They don't want to reform the church. They want to restore the church. They want the church to be remade from the ground up, not simply 
compare to God's Word and transform through the Word and the Spirit, but reinvent it altogether. Here in America, classic example of this, something that we, have, we see throughout history, but, but is a good example here, is the work of Thomas Campbell. Thomas Campbell was a Presbyterian minister, came from Northern Ireland to America, and he became disenchanted with Presbyterian teaching. And he said, our fundamental problem is we have all these creeds, these statements of faith. We need to just go back to simple Christianity. And Thomas Campbell uh, began to create these Christian connections and Christian churches that were separate from everyone else. And they thought that they were so much better because they didn't have creeds. They didn't have all these other things. They thought they were just being simple Christians. Thomas Campbell was followed by his son, Alexander Campbell. They joined with a man by the name of Barton Stone. Together, these movements coalesced into the, the, the big restorationist movement of the early 19th century. And what they appealed to was this picture of the perfect church in the book of Acts. They said, well, they didn't have creeds. Sure, they, they said, Jesus is Lord. And there were some things in the, in the epistles about some doctrinal issues. But we need to just get rid of those things and let's just be simple Christians. Now, what's funny is in giving up creeds like the Nicene Creed, they immediately fell into one of the early church heresies. Barton Stone denied the deity of Christ. He denied the Trinity, denied that Christ was, was truly God. And though the Campbells didn't go along with that, it didn't stop them from, from sticking together. They were unified by a common enemy in what they saw as all the denominations out there. And they were very anti-denominational. So they start this movement. Well, the restorationism that they appealed to wasn't very practical. They had some of these trappings and things like this, but there was a desire for many people, well, if we're going to be truly an apostolic church, where are our apostles? Where's the, where, where's the authority? Where's, where's the... The, the Holy Spirit blessing in the same way that we see in the book of Acts. And as a consequence, 3,500 of the early, earliest Mormons, not all of them, but 3,500 of the very early Mormons, including people like uh, the Pratts, Sidney Rigdon, and a host of others, they ended up going towards Mormonism. Mormonism answered the questions raised by Campbell. Campbell pointed to all the divisions out there, and ultimately, what does he produce? He produces more divisions. Even his own movement doesn't stay together. They end up splintering because they find that this ideal of the perfect church is something that is not so easy to attain. I want to look at what we see of the history of the church from the scriptures and see what should we expect in a fallen world when, uh, when we go out looking for the church of Jesus Christ. Now I want to begin in the Old Testament. And I understand that there are many people who have a dispensationalist mindset who think that the church didn't exist in the Old Testament. They divorce the Old Testament from the church. They say, well, that's Israel. We're the church. Uh, there's no connection there. But that's not the reality. I, I've spent programs dealing with this. If you want to see uh, how we've dealt with it in the past, I encourage you to go back and look at uh, some of the, the past episodes on this subject. You can access them at ancientpast.tv. But just briefly, the word in Greek, ekklesia, that is used over and over to describe the church, was not a new term for those first century believers. The Septuagint, which was the Greek translation of the Old Testament done about 200 years before Christ, it used that term ecclesia over and over and over again to describe the congregation 
in the Old Testament, the, the Old Testament church, Israel. And we see all kinds of connections that are made. In the New Testament, we're told that we have been grafted on to that olive tree, that we are sons of Abraham through faith, that we are the Israel of God. Paul tells the Philippians that we are the circumcision who worship God in spirit. It's not that the church has replaced Israel. It's that the natural branches have largely been broken off for unbelief. We've been grafted in through the mercy of God. And we stand together. Ephesians 2. The Ephesians are Greeks. They're Gentiles. And Paul tells them how they were strangers, aliens from the covenant of, uh, that God had made with Israel. But through the blood of Christ, they had been brought near. That middle wall of partition had been broken down. From the two, God made one. So through faith, we are sons of Abraham. The church is not something new. We see the terms switch back and forth. Psalm 22 and Hebrews 2 give the same passage with the congregation, talking of Israel in one, and the church in Hebrews 2, taking its place in the exact same quote. We see James in chapter 2 of his epistle calling the church the synagogue. Over and over we see that, this is, that the church is not something new. It is something that goes back to the earliest days of God's people. So what do we see in the Old Testament? Do we see a perfect church anywhere in the Old Testament? No, there have always been problems. You go back to Cain and Abel. Abel loves God. He worships God in truth. He offers a sacrifice that is acceptable to God. And yet what do we see right beside that true worship? We see a counterfeit. We see unregenerate man offering worship not according to what pleases God, but what, what pleases Him. Over and over we see that there are counterfeits, that sinful men, men who are unregenerate in heart, they have a religion. This isn't something new. And we see that even amongst the people of God, that often there is unbelief, there is compromise, and there is apostasy. When Moses brings the people of Egypt, or people of Israel out of Egypt, rather, they see all the miracles. God feeds them with manna. They have the, the pillar of cloud by day, the pillar of fire by night. And yet when Moses goes up on Mount Sinai and doesn't come down, what do they do? they create a golden calf. And it's Aaron who tells Moses, we, we, we had the men pluck off their earrings and we threw the gold into the fire and out popped this golden calf. We see that the God-appointed priest, <coughs> excuse me, the God-appointed priest is compromised. His sons, Nadab and Abihu, they offer a sacrifice to God. They offer uh, incense that God isn't pleased with. Does that mean that there needs to be a reinvention of the church? No. God judges them. The fire of the Lord goes out and consumes these men. Korah, Dathan, and Abiram, they want to be Aaronic priests. Are they qualified to be Aaronic priests? No, they're Levites. They're of the right tribe, but they are not qualified. They are not descendants of Aaron. They presume to take that honor to themselves. Is this a totally separate counterfeit from the, from the true church? No. It's corruption within the church itself. But God does deal with it. God judges them. He has the people withdraw from Korah, Dathan, Abiram, and their families, and the earth opens up and swallows them. 
their 250 followers, the fire of the Lord goes out and consumes them as they're holding their little censers, burning incense to God. They become the incense. We see sin even amongst God's people. Going back before Moses, we see with Abraham. Abraham is the one who is prepared to offer his son there on Mount Moriah. Aaron, excuse me, Abraham, who even before that took his servants and went up against Ketelaomer and all these other kings who had plundered Sodom to rescue Lot, his nephew. And yet this great man of faith, the father of the faithful, is also prepared to lie and to have his wife violated by Pharaoh and Abimelech, saying, she's my sister. Isaac, who doesn't even have some thread of truth in it, says the same thing about Rebecca. She's my sister. We should not expect to see a perfect church with imperfect people. The church is going to be perfect. This doesn't mean the church isn't holy. It doesn't mean that we aren't called to reform the church and to seek to, to be godly. But if we have the expectation the church is going to be perfect, then we open ourselves up to deception. We, we open ourselves up to people who say, well, obviously they're all wrong, so let's do it right. Let's, let's reinvent the church. It's happened over and over in church history. And it has never produced the perfect church. In fact, it has produced counterfeits. It's produced cults. It's produced sometimes churches that are not overtly heretical, but they are schismatic. Where you end up with what I've called in the past the Church of Bob, where there's some leader who, who puts his imprint on everything. And there's no sense of, of true Catholicity, no sense of, of being part of the historic church, that we're not tr treading a new path, but we're treading a path that has been well-worn before us, that there are other generations who have read these same scriptures. When we expect unrealistic things, then we open ourselves up to being misled into counterfeits. And I think that's what's happened all too often. But let's, let's continue to look. I'm, I'm going to open up the phone lines here because I hope you see where we're going with this. And I, I, I look forward to, to some conversation this evening. Phone number here at the station is 801-973-TV20. That's 801-973-8820. And we're discussing Reformation versus Restoration. Should we expect a perfect church? Should we be distressed and think that we must be living in the very last months or years of history because the church is in bad shape today here in America. Well, what do we see after the time of Moses? Do we see that there is a perfect church? No. I could give of countless examples, but look, look at David, the man after God's own heart. David, the, the, the sweet psalmist of Israel. David, who, who took the sling and charged Goliath. is the same David who is an adulterer with Bathsheba, a liar, and ultimately the murderer of Uriah the Hittite. This is God's people. He is the king. He is the one through whom the Holy Spirit gives us the Psalms. And yet there's corruption. I find it intriguing that this defense is often given for the problems that we see among Latter-day Saint general authorities. That obviously, well, there were problems with men in the past. 
But what was the whole basis of the claim that the church had ceased to, to exist in any authoritative form, that the, that the priesthood had to be uh, reestablished and all these various things? It was because of the supposed sinfulness and weakness and division of the church. And yet the irony is, is lost on them because they don't see that Joseph Smith didn't bring anything different. He brought division. He brought all these other things. So let's continue looking. You have the division of the kingdom of Israel after the death of Solomon. You have Rehoboam in, uh, in the south, uh, Jeroboam in the north. What does the northern kingdom do? The northern kingdom creates counterfeit temples in Bethel and Dan. And in the, the to, just to show you how deep the idiocy of sin goes, what do, what do they worship there at these false temples? They said, basically remember what's happening. Jeroboam leads the northern ten tribes in rebellion against Rehoboam. But the temple was down in Jerusalem, and so there's going to be this temptation for people as they keep going to the temple to end up going back to the Davidic line to submit themselves to the descendants of David. So what they have to do is they have to set up their own temples to keep people away from Jerusalem. Well, they set up counterfeit temples. And in those temples, they worship golden calves, just like their forefathers had. So let's look at it from the outside. Well, we have, we have the people in Judah claiming to have the truth. And then we have the people in Samaria claiming to have the truth. So obviously, there must be some problem because there's a division, right? I mean, if the Holy Spirit were really present, there wouldn't be any division, right? Wrong. There's a counterfeit because the world, flesh, and the devil are active. Man is always going to be religious. And sometimes that religion is going to be uh, something very far removed from what we see in the scriptures. You know, you go to India, and you can go to the temple with a monkey god. And you can see Indians taking the monkey feces and rubbing it all in their hair. Seeking the blessings of the monkey god. You can also go to churches that sound very Christian but have, have forsaken the very heart of the historic biblical faith. You have in that northern kingdom, Elijah. Elijah sees that, that Jezebel has killed so many of the priests, or excuse me, so many of the prophets of God. And he's convinced that he alone is left. Even Elijah, who had been there at Mount Carmel and had withstood the, the prophets of Baal and made clear, you know, here, here was division within Israel. There were people who, they didn't, they didn't deny that the Lord was God. They just thought the Lord was God and Baal was God and so many others were gods. And many of them would have said, well, the Lord is the great God. But they had these, these priests of Baal. Elijah withstands them. And you know the whole story is told there of how they, the prophets of Baal cry all day, cutting themselves, throwing blood in the air, everything. Baal, we cry to thee. Nothing happens. Elijah, after having his offering doused over and over with water, prays, simple prayer, fire comes from heaven, consumes it all. There was division. There was sinfulness even with Elijah. Was Elijah the perfect man of God in the midst of all this? Was there at least some remnant of perfection? No, Elijah 
after Mount Carmel, after seeing this triumph, after seeing the end of this three and a half years of drought, he hears that Jezebel seeks his life and he's ready to die. He prays, Lord, take my life. He's a sinful man. He's a godly man too. There is a fundamental essential difference between him and the priest of Baal. But he is shown warts and all in the scripture. It's when people think that they're supposed to be a perfect church that then they fall prey to the people who say, well, we're going to recreate one when there never has been one. We're going to continue to look through the Old and then the New Testament. But first I want to go to our caller, Valerie, from West Valley. Uh, Valerie, good to have you with us this evening. Okay. Um, that's what you've been saying there. Um, through the Old and New Testament, Jeremiah, I mean, Jeremiah never brought anybody into salvation, but he was a strong prophet of God. And the whole thing is, as Charles Spurgeon nailed it back in his day when he said, when modernism was coming into the church back then, and he was talking about, you know, entertaining people, having itching ears, shortening the sermons, not being boring, all of this kind of stuff. And um, <clears throat> the truth is absolutely important. And there's so many today, they get on television, they got all this stuff. And they preach if you don't have finances, you know, you're not saved and all kinds of things. And they've got all of these people up and, and entertained and coming because of, of, but the truth, the truth is being watered down. And, and even back then it did, uh, Going into the 20th century, it not only destroyed churches, but it divided churches, and and it brought people into liberalism and Marxism and everything. It's very destructive, and it's time that that they got back to the truth and the basics. And it's like he, he, the Lord said, he, like He told Jeremiah and Ezekiel and all of them, "You tell them what I say. They may if the, whether they listen or not. That's you know. But you tell them the truth. You tell them what it is. You tell them like it is." You know, and you don't have to expect massive uh, conversions, but the ones that are will be on fertile ground. Yep. You see what I'm saying? Definitely. Valerie, thank you so much for your comments. Thank you. Valerie makes great point. And uh, just, just to tell you, I didn't get a chance to tell you while you're on the line there, but uh, if you like Spurgeon, uh, you're in West Valley, come see us some Sunday. We have morning services at 11 a.m., uh, Sunday school's at 9.30 a.m., and then we have uh, evening worship, worship at 5.30 p.m., uh, just a little further west there on Main Street in Magna, 8630 West, 2700 South. Uh, we love Spurgeon. Um, disagree with him on baptism, but just about everything else we agree with. The, what she touched on was, in Jeremiah's day, what do we see? We see apostasy. And yet, what is the answer to apostasy? It's not to reinvent the church. It's not to separate and splinter the church. It is to promote discipline within the church to put the ungodly out, yes. But it is for the church to be the church and to stand for the truth and to reform itself according to God's word. Spurgeon, she talked about the modernism and the things in his day. You go back and you read about the downgrade controversy and it is amazing the parallels between the downgrade controversy of the mid-1900s, or 19th century, excuse me, uh, the mid-1800s, uh, to look at the downgrade controversy that Spurgeon was involved with and what we see today. Yes, there are many people who think that we can water down and sweeten up the gospel, that we can somehow make it palatable to, to, to sinful men, and they bring destruction. But it's not new. We've fought this battle before. And what, what frustrates me is that even among evangelicals, there is this temptation to say, oh, well, this must mean that this is the end. And we, sh we should just give up. We should turn the church into an evangelistic society. We shouldn't worry about trying to teach men to observe all things whatsoever Christ has commanded. But let's just get them to, to pray the sinner's prayer and make converts. And you know the old rules have changed because this is something so new. 
The reality is when you go back through church history, when you go back through the scriptures, see what happened in the Old Testament, see what happens in the New, and then see what has happened ever since, you recognize that there are clear patterns that men are sinful. Unregenerate men are going to counterfeit and attack and demean and, and do everything they can to the truth. And even within the remnant of, of those who are true believers, all too often there's going to be sin. There's going to be failures. There's going to be uh, disagreements. And sometimes it can lead to, to uh, a division that's not godly, that by God's grace can, bring, can be healed again. You know, just one example of this when Paul and Barnabas are getting ready to go out on the second missionary journey, Barnabas wants to take Mark along. Well, Mark had abandoned them in the middle of the first one, and Paul doesn't want to bring him along. And it brings such a dispute, they end up separating. They continue to work together. I mean, they, they continue to work for the same purposes, but they don't work together anymore. And yet, what do we see in 2 Timothy? Paul says, to, to have Mark come. He tells Timothy uh, to send for Mark because he is profitable for the ministry. Things can be healed. Matthew 18, when your brother sins against you, what do you do? Do you, do you excommunicate him? Unilaterally, like you're a pope? No, you go to him, you have to seek to be reconciled. If he doesn't confess and repent of his sin, you bring witnesses. If he still doesn't repent, you bring it to the church. It may be that the church tells him that he's wrong. It may be the church tells you that you're wrong. But through that, there's supposed to be reconciliation and, and, and reunion. But what people set up is this, is this false ideal. Well, the church, the church there in Acts, they're all in harmony. They don't read the rest of the book of Acts. We'll get to that in a moment. What do we see when we go through the history of the church in the Old Testament? We see, like in Ezekiel 8, that we have a vision of God taking Ezekiel to the temple. And he tells him to dig a hole and to, 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 to look inside the temple. And what he sees is idolatry. He sees women weeping for Tammuz. He sees all kinds of abominations. He sees false worship there in the very temple of God. Well, what, what is the answer that many people have when they see something like that today? Well, let's go do something new. There must be something fundamentally wrong. We're either going to do it as a Bible-based group like, like the Campbells, or we're going to pray that God will send some new priesthood, some new prophet, some new this or that or the other, instead of recognizing that the church is called to be faithful and to, and to reform itself according to God's Word and to practice discipline within the church. The schismatic idea that when there's, when there's one problem, you have to go and split off into some new group. And when there's a problem in that group, split off into some smaller group, and then to another, and to another. I have seen so many professed Christians who cannot be in community with anyone. And like I said last week, how do you claim to be faithful to Christ when you refuse to hear the church? Matthew 18, if they do not hear the church, let them be to you as a heathen and a tax collector. Now this hasn't been taught, and you know, maybe you're not fully aware of that yet. But what church do you have to listen to? Who are your elders? Hebrews 13, 17, we're supposed to submit to those in authority over us as those who keep watch over our souls, as those that must give account. Or, uh, I paraphrase a little loosely there. We submit be, uh, because, for they keep watch over your souls. 
To whom do you submit as your elders? To whom do they submit? Where is our accountability? Where is the visible church today? We have to recognize that on the one hand, the church is not optional. We can't simply sit at home and read our books and not be in community. Like we talked about last week, that's like a disembodied I. Paul describes us as members of a body. And we are to bear one another's burdens. We're to, to encourage and correct one another. And when you pluck yourself off from the body and say, I don't need the body, you're being foolish. You're doing harm to yourself and you're doing harm to the body of Christ. One of the reasons the church is so weak today is because people, it's this catch-22. People don't value the church one of the reasons they don't value it is they see it as weak. The fact they don't value it means that they don't come in and do the hard work of reforming the church and also working within the church to do what the church has been called to do. Well, let's keep looking. We've, we've gone through the Old Testament. What do we see at the time of Christ? We see that there are some true believers, such as Simeon, who takes... Uh, the infant Christ into his arms and, and sings of the glory of God. We, we see Anna, we see uh, Zacharias and Elizabeth, the, the parents of John the Baptist. We see a number of, of people like that. We also see that by and large that the church has been corrupted to where it is hardly recognizable anymore. We see that there are Pharisees Pharisees who are very godly on the outside, but they're full of corruption. They're only concerned with how they appear to themselves and men. They never deal with the heart. We see Sadducees who don't believe there's any resurrection, and they basically believe in partying life away because there are no consequences. We see all these divisions. Does Jesus come to establish something new. No. The, the natural branches are broken off for unbelief, but it's the same olive tree. It's not that the promises to Abraham have failed, but that the promise to Abraham that he would be the father of many nations, literally, if you want to transliterate that from the Hebrew, the promise is that he would be the father of many goyim, a term that's often used derisively by Jews, for Gentiles. Go back and look at Genesis. He will be the father of many goyim. It's not that the, that the promises have failed. Galatians 3, we are children of Abraham. So we're going to keep looking at the New Testament, but I want, to, I want to open up the phone lines again. If you'd like to join in the discussion, we're talking about the idea of reformation versus restoration. Is there something fundamentally wrong when we don't see a perfect church that we have to somehow restore it? That we have to somehow look for some new dispensation of God, some new prophet, some new this or that or the other? Or is it that our expectations are wrong and that this idea of the perfect church is leading us astray? Well, what I hope we saw in looking at the Old Testament is that the church wasn't perfect. Even among true believers, there was sin. And those are detailed in, in the life of Abraham. Uh, we have uh, Judah, the, the son of, well, you go through just about every one of them. Just go through the genealogy in Matthew and look at the people who are mentioned there. Judah has uh, Perez and um, Zerah, was it Zerah? I'm sorry, of Tamar. Uh, Tamar was a Canaanite who seduced her father-in-law when her husband was struck dead for his immorality. And uh, then was given to Onan, who then was struck dead by God. And when Judah won't give her to his youngest son, then she seduces her, her own father-in-law. 
the people are shown that even amongst God's people, even amongst people like David and Abraham and Moses and these, all these others, there's no perfection. Yes, they have been changed. Yes, they have been given new hearts. But there's not perfection in any of them. Well, what about in the New Testament? New Testament, we have book of Acts, right? But what does the book of Acts detail? The book of Acts details not only this wonderful, glorious time of, of peace and harmony among God's people, but even in the very midst of it, there was, counter, there was a counterfeit. There were false brothers. We have people like Ananias and Sapphira who lie and are struck dead. We have Simon Magus who wants to uh, buy the Holy Spirit. And then you keep going and you find out all of a sudden there are all these problems out there. You find that there are Judaizers in Acts 15 who are coming along in the name of Christ. These aren't people coming uh, denying Christ. These are people who are saying, we are Christians. We believe Jesus is Lord. We believe that He is the Son of God. We believe all these wonderful things. You go down a checklist and everything practically that you can imagine, we agree with. And we believe that it is necessary in order for you to be saved that you have to be circumcised. Because after all, isn't this the fulfillment of the Old Testament promises? There are people who tell us that today. The, I, I mentioned earlier uh, Thomas Campbell. Uh, we didn't have the graphics ready, but I, if you have that, I'd love for you to see a picture of him. He's, he's wild looking. Uh, and so is his son, Alexander. If you get those, you can fade them up. But um, they, tell, they taught, and their, their disciples today in the Church of Christ say that if you are not baptized, you cannot be saved. It is necessary. It is, it is indispensable to salvation that you be baptized. It's one of the reasons that I think the LDS have such an emphasis on baptism is because the vast majority of them came right out of Campbellite teaching. These were people who were looking for a restoration before they ever met Joseph Smith. Sidney Rigdon, his whole congregation that he leads in and, and, and helps prompt the, the move to Kirtland, Ohio, is uh, where do they come from? They are Campbellites, and they had fallen out with Campbell. And they're just waiting for somebody to come along with a better restoration. And along comes Smith. What do we see in the church? We see Judaizers. The Judaizers are saying that it is necessary to be saved. Well, is that a big deal? It's a big enough deal that the Apostle Paul can write to the Galatians and, and tell them that he is appalled that they have gone after another gospel that is no gospel. He can tell them that if I or an angel from heaven declare any other gospel than the one you have received, let them be accursed. And just so there's no doubt in their minds, in Galatians 5 he tells them that if they are circumcised, trying to keep the law for themselves, that Christ will profit them nothing. They are denying Christ if they have themselves circumcised, trying to keep the law. Now, it's not that there was something inherently wrong in circumcision. Because a little later in the book of Acts, you find that Paul... Uh, well, even there, in, in the uh, third missionary journey, he goes to Jerusalem, meets up with James, and James is concerned that there are people in the church who have been informed about Paul that he is forbidding people to follow Moses and to have their children circumcised. Paul never did that. Paul denied that it was necessary to salvation. It's, it is... It is a vast difference. We believe that it is a serious sin to neglect baptism. But do we say that you are not able to be saved apart from baptism? No. 
I've had conversations. I've, there may be some who will give a better explanation than I've heard from others, but in talking to some Church of Christ people, I've asked, you know, what about the, the thief on the cross? They said, well, he was baptized. Really, how do you know? Because he was saved. Where do you find it in the text? Well, we know that you have to be baptized in order to be saved, so he had to be baptized. It's like, when? <laughs> but what you find are here, here are people who are professing Christians that Paul says are no Christians at all, who are preaching a false gospel. He withstands them to their face and excludes them. And we see over and over there are all kinds of issues in the apostolic churches. Not just churches today, but the very, you know, the very churches planted by Paul. In Corinth, we have a man who marries his father's wife. And they think this is a wonderful thing. This is showing grace. And Paul's livid. He said, you're, you're tolerating what the, what, what the unbelievers don't even mention. He says, cast the evildoer out from among you. They were compromised. And yet, how does he address them? He addresses them as, as the church. Please be clear. What I am arguing is not that we should just look at the compromised state of the church and that we should say, oh, well, what do you expect? We also don't do, take the opposite extreme and say, well, uh, the, church, the church has compromised, you know, there's, there's a problem in the church here, therefore, if I'm going to be pure, I have to come out from amongst them, and then come out from amongst that group, and come out from amongst the other, and come out from amongst the other until it's the church of me and my wife, and I'm not too sure about her. That's Roger Williams' um, view of things. I'm not talking about my wife, but she puts up with me, which shows her sanctification is greater than mine. But at any rate, what we see is that there is there's theological error, even amongst Christians. We see that there is, there is sin, even within the church, that sometimes isn't properly dealt with. It's supposed to be. What does Paul call them to? Does he, does he write to some remnant within that church to, to come out from amongst all the others and to condemn them all. No, he calls them to be reformed according to God's word. We see that there are Gnostics who are professed Christians in, in uh, Colossae. We see that uh, probably in Ephesus that First and Second John is dealing with people who say that Jesus has, has uh, come, but he did not really come in the flesh. What do, how does John deal with that? Does John say, oh, well, what do you expect? No, he calls them antichrist. I love that short second epistle of John because to me it brings together what I'm trying to focus on tonight. On the one hand, the church is not to be disturbed by the fact that there are counterfeits out there, that there are people who are professed believers who are teaching heresy, not just error, but heresy, and can be called antichrist. Half that little epistle is dealing with telling the people not to be partakers in their sins, not to have anything to do with them. But the other half of that little epistle is concerned with telling them to love one another. What do you do if you're in a, in a, in a church that's compromised? Number one, you recognize that's, that's the reality this side of heaven. So then what do you do? You seek to be faithful. You pursue reform. Within the avenues that are available within that local congregation, you try to do what is right. You call them to faithfulness. We have people who sometimes they come to, to, to our church, uh, to our congregation, and they are members of another congregation. I tell them, you need to exhaust the avenues for reform where you are before you leave. If, if they're in an evangelical Bible, you know, at least a church that professes to believe the Bible. And what I do is I tell them, 
first of all, you need to memorize Galatians 6, 1. That if a brother is overcome in a trespass, let you that are spiritual restore such a one in a spirit of gentleness, lest you also be tempted. You see, there's a, there's a huge difference between those who love God and thus love His church, those who love Christ and love His bride, versus those who are looking for excuses to splinter. Those who love Christ and His, and, and his bride, I believe, have to take seriously the call to gentleness, to meekness, that when we see the apostasy in the church, we don't gloat over it. We weep over it. And we give people the benefit of the doubt until they have proven themselves otherwise. So number one, you memorize Galatians 6, 1. You go th then to your knees and you pray. You pray that God would reform His church. And then you go, and in humility, you bring the Word of God through the avenues that are available. Unfortunately, most churches don't have any form of discipline. They don't have any avenues for, for, for being corrected by God's Word. But you do what you can. And if they hear you, then you, you get down on your knees and you thank God. If they will not hear you, then I believe you have the freedom to find a, a congregation that will be faithful. But one of the things I try to make clear to people, are we a perfect church? It's been joked. We're, we're, uh, we're a member congregation of the OPC, the Orthodox Presbyterian Church, and people have made jokes that we think it means only perfect church. If it, if it was a perfect church, they wouldn't have let me in. If it was perfect church, they wouldn't have let any of us in. We do try to be a faithful church. We are going to make mistakes, just like the church in the New Testament, just like the church in the Old Testament. But we try to follow God's Word. We try to hold these things up. What's the fruit of the Campbells? Did they bring about this great Christian unity and a church that is so much better than all the others? No. They brought further division. You get the Church of Christ, the Christian Church, the Disciples of Christ, and a whole host of others that come out of that movement. They lay the foundations for the Mormon Church. How about Joseph Smith? Joseph Smith claimed not to have just a restoration from the Bible, but he claimed to have a restoration directly from God. Did that bring that perfect church? Did it, bring, did it do away with, with division? No, there's 200 plus different splinter groups just off of those who claim that Joseph Smith is a prophet of God. So do we have to go out into a grove and pray, Lord, help me to know which one is right? The whole point of the last two and a half years has been that we have a comfort. Tradition is not infallible. Only the Bible is. But it is a great comfort when we go back and we find that when we read Charles Spurgeon from 150 years ago, when we read Jonathan Edwards from 260 years ago, when we read John Calvin, Martin Luther, when you go back through the history of the church, go through the Middle Ages, with some of the people there, sure, there's, a, there's error, there's heresy, there's other things. But when we go back, and we go back to the early church and read Chrysostom and Augustine, when we go back and read all these people, we find that there is this clear stream of understanding in terms of who is God, who is man, what is sin, who is Jesus Christ, what is salvation. And that every attempt to water down and sweeten up the gospel has always been a failure we're not more loving than God, and we're not smarter than Him either. And so what we need to do is go back to our knees, back to the Word, and back into fellowship with His people. 
and recognize the church in spite of her failings, in spite of having sinful people in it, in spite of being attacked from without, from within, and, and having a constant war, which is only all, all that you should expect in a fallen world. In spite of all that, she is the bride of Christ. She is the pillar and ground of the truth. She is not optional. And we need to love the bride if we love the bridegroom. And we need to hold fast to one another and be the church. Well, I hope to flesh this out a little more in the future. If you would like more information, we invite you to go to our website, ancientpaths.tv, or the church website, christpres.net. We are sponsored by Christ Presbyterian Church, uh, a congregation of the Orthodox Presbyterian denomination. I'm the pastor, Jason Wallace. We meet Sunday mornings at 11 a.m. and at Sunday evenings at 5.30 p.m at 8630 West, 2700 South. We have a sister congregation in Ogden that meets at 9 a.m. at 3350 Harrison Boulevard. Greatly encourage you to attend there. The Lord's been blessing that new work mightily. And we also have a study now down in Utah County on Sunday afternoons at 430 in the American Fork Senior Center. If you'd like more information on any of that, we invite you to give us a call at 801-969-7948. Look to the past and recognize there is truth and God does bless His church. Till next time, we wish you the Lord's greatest blessings. Good night. You